Good morning, brothers and sisters, as we begin a new week. Shall we seek our Heavenly Father's guidance as we open his word and consider the examples, the symbols, and the lessons that are before us in the 13th chapter of Judges? Shall we pray? Loving Father in heaven, As we come before you in this new week, we thank you for this opportunity we have to gather together. Direct us, Father, because we know that time is short and that meetings like this may soon not be available. Help us now, Father, as we open your word to consider the symbols that are before us. Direct us so that we may see this light for what it is. Father, we need your spirit because it is by your spirit that our minds are enlightened. We thank you for your spirit. We thank you. that we are able to come together to study and to consider that which you would have us to know. Direct us now, may your angels attend us. May we be able to breathe the very atmosphere of heaven. Help us now. For this we pray in Jesus' name, amen. Okay, now as we've been recovering the ground here in Judges 13, we have been looking so that we could begin to understand more completely the symbolism that is within this chapter and that we would see more figurative applications for the different things that, that are being pointed out. Now, the premise that we've been operating under and that we operated when we started this on Thursday is that we are being shown in the instructions giving, given to Manoah and to his wife, the types of righteousness by faith. Specifically, we're being shown that the instructions that were given to them before the birth of Samson are part of the right arm of the gospel, the health message. Now, were there other items that we have been noting within this chapter? Well, um, so the thing is, this is during the time of the Philistines, we had looked at the chronology a little bit. So we know that the Philistines are oppressing Israel for uh, 40 years, and that this is going to be sometime in that period. And it's going to, the 20 years of Samson are going to include that. They're going to be contemporary with those 40 years. It's not afterwards. Um, and then we had also looked at... Uh, Well, we have Manoah, this man. He's from Zorah, and he's of the family of the Danites, and his wife's barren. So, what was there? There was some other thing. So, there were some questions about what this barren meant. And 
we know that there's this parallel with uh, Isaiah chapter 7. Thou shalt conceive and bear a son, right? So the idea that this is representing um, the 144,000 who are going to uh, represent Christ, that is, they're going to have his character. But this is looking at this history basically in the challenges that they face. So this command, I pray thee, drink not wine nor strong drink, and eat not any unclean thing. Um, this Nazarite vow, this is a sign of, of who God's people are in the last days. I know there's more. Well, okay, now as a question, we have identified that Manoah and his wife were Danites. Mm -hmm. And so that would mean that Samson was also a Danite, right? Correct? Yeah, and, he, and he's the first judge that's actually a judge. In the sense that Dan means a judge. So he is given that, that he is one, one of the last judges, he represents a judge of judges. Mm -hmm. So in that he is representing the 144,000 or a type toward the 144,000, he is also being brought up to be a representation of Christ. Yep. Now, isn't he technically, I mean, the last judge before Samuel, right? Right, but Samuel being the last judge. Yeah. But there is a transition. Samuel is a little bit different. Samuel is very different. Yeah. So, so he has a different role. So he's the last of what I call the normal judges. But the regular types of judges that are raised up. Samuel has a different, a different role. Samuel definitely has a different role because he is a judge, but he is also a Levite, mm -hmm. right? Yeah, so he's a priest. Correct. So there's, there's something there. We, we haven't got there yet, but right. he represents the final generation. Okay. So as we're going through this, at the time the Lord appeared to the wife of Manoah, an Israelite of the tribe of Dan, and informed her that she should have a son. And in view of this, he gave her special instruction concerning her own habits and also for the treatment of the child. Now, therefore, beware, I pray thee, and drink neither wine nor strong drink. Now, why is he saying beware? Is there is there something in the Hebrew that is specific for this translation of this word to say beware? Um, yeah, so which verse is that? Oh, verse four. Um, yeah, it just means like be on your guard or watch, observe, keep, preserve, protect, um, pay heed. So in, in a manner of speaking, the parents of Samson were to be watchmen. Yeah, be aware. Yeah. So now, therefore, beware, I pray thee, and drink neither wine nor strong drink, and eat not any unclean thing. These were of the tribe of Dan. They were living in Israel, but it was a time of apostasy, where the children of Israel had sought Congress and relation with the Philistines, with those nations around them, but God had told them not to. 
go into close relations with these people. He also directed that no razor should come upon the head of the child, for he was to be consecrated to God as a Nazarite from his birth, and through him the Lord would begin to deliver Israel from the Philistines. So he would begin to deliver Israel from the Philistines. And the point that was brought out last week is the delivery from the Philistines was completed with David. God himself appeared to the wife of Manoah and told her that she should have a son and that he should be a great man and deliver Israel. Then he gave her special instructions regarding her diet. She must not use wine or strong drink, for this would affect her offspring. Who is it that says this? It is the God of heaven. He has a right to say it, for he made man. He has a right to the affections and the whole mind of man. He has made man in his own image, and he expects that man will render to him the powers that he has imparted to him. Let us regard this as instruction given to every mother in our world. If you want your children to have well-balanced minds, you must be temperate yourselves. Keep your own heart and affection sound and healthful, that you may impart to your offspring a beautiful mind and body, or healthful mind and body, excuse me. Now, <clears throat> the mother is being given the instruction. Is this not symbolically the same as if the church is given the instruction? Well, yes. It was to equate that to the 144, I would say yes. Okay. So 1863? Yes. But for today, the example that and the and the witness that I gave when we were talking about this on Thursday, I am most aware of those within the church, leaders within the church, pastors within the church that have chosen that it's okay to eat unclean things, that it's okay to eat crab, it's okay to eat shrimp, it's okay to eat snails. It would not be beyond many. Oh, it's okay to have a little bacon. It's okay to have a little ham. Does God mean what he says when he gives us a dietary law? Now, um, so just going back a little bit to the idea that, that she's barren. So the church is barren. Right. And um, why, why is that? I mean, if we're looking at something before 1863, would this have to do with the Laodicean condition of the church? And what is the condition of Laodicea? Poor, well, blind, and naked, right? Wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked, yeah. Okay. At that time, here is the wife of Manoah. Would it not be have been seen by a woman at that time that if she could not have children, that she was wretched, that she was unable to bear? Mm -hmm. 
Yeah. Now, we also had commented that the 40 years can represent the four generations of Adventism as well. Okay. <laughs> now, comment from the chat is it's asking if there, the five attributes are pointing toward the five virgins, the wise virgins. Right? Five foolish. The five foolish virgins? Okay. The wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked. But that condition would be the antithesis of the wise virgins. Right. And we see here that Samson is representing uh, not an ideal but more the reality of the condition of the church. Okay. I mean, we see that in the end he's victorious, but he's really not. Um, I mean, he's not a Samuel. No. Not in any regard. To understand what value the Lord has placed upon human beings, look to Calvary. They are of great value in the sight of God. In order to elevate man, Christ left his honor and glory in heaven and came to our earth to die. The very Christ that redeemed man by dying in his behalf gave instruction to the wife of Manoah. And through that record to the people generally. That very same Jesus who so values man tells him what is for his best and highest interest in this world. Then should we not seek to preserve every God-given power in the very best condition to serve him? The very best that we can give to God is feeble enough. He has given us a habitation here, our bodies, for which we must have a special care. Why is there so much misery and suffering in the world today? Is it because God loves to see his creation miserable? Just no. Miserable. It is because the immoral habits of man have weakened his physical, mental, and moral powers. We mourn over Adam's transgression and seem to think that our first parents showed great weakness in yielding to temptation. But if Adam's transgression were the only evil that we had to meet, this would be in a much better condition than it is. This world would be in a much better condition than it is. There's been a succession of falls since Adam's day. The world that Christ came to was very different from the world that he created. Here now is the example of Manoah and his wife prior to the birth of Samson. So being barren, she would have been wretched. She would have been miserable. So the application of Laodicea and the time of Laodicea would fit. Then the woman came and told her husband, saying, a man of God came unto me, and his countenance was like the countenance of an angel of God, very terrible. But I asked him not whence he was, neither told me his name. Why would it be important that in her mind 
that the name of the messenger should be given. What was your question again? Why would it be important to this woman's mind that the name of the messenger be given? Well, I think the point is here that the name isn't given. So um, would this not be Palmoni? Yes. I can't see any different. Yeah. I mean, because I mean, Palmoni is the wonderful number or the number of secrets. But his name here is hidden, is the basic idea. So in, in following this counsel that has been given, the woman, the church, has been given a message from Palmoni. Now, this is, this is one of those situations that we're going to be able to use when we are giving a witness to those that do not believe the writings of, of Ellen White. Because as we go further into this study, into this chapter, we're going to be given evidence that this is indeed Christ. And we will be able to do that in, in using the proof text method. So, but he said unto me, behold, thou shalt conceive and bear a son. And now drink no wine nor strong drink, neither eat any unclean thing. For the child shall be a Nazarite to God from the womb to the day of his death. So the child was to be a Nazarite all of his days. He was to be committed to God all of his days. Is this also not what we see in the life of Samuel? I mean, we're given the name Samson. We're given the name Samuel. What does Samson mean? And of course, what does Samuel mean? On Strong, this is Samson means sunlight or something pertaining to the sun. Yeah, it means sunlight. Okay. Brilliant. <clears throat> Wouldn't this have been light to Israel in that he was there to relieve the Philistine oppression? Amen. Oh, I'm thinking of Malachi 4 too about the son of righteousness arising with healing in his wings. So it's a high calling. The woman sought her husband, and after describing the heavenly visitant, she repeated the message of the angel. Then, fearful that they should make some mistake in the important work committed to them, the husband prayed earnestly, Let the man of God, which thou didst send, come again unto us, and teach us what we shall do unto the child that shall be born.
like Mary, like the husband of Elizabeth, they are given notification before the birth of the child. But in this situation, it is Manoah that prays earnestly. Mary speaks with Gabriel. John's father listens to what is said, but is left unable to speak when Gabriel leaves. And until John is born, he is unable to speak. Here, Manoah is asking for Christ to come again and to teach them what is to be done for the child. What symbol do we see here? Why is this important for us to note? Uh, so praying father expresses great great desire to be able to raise his child right to provide for family as God would. There's also a repetition. Like a repeat of history. Okay. I don't know if that. It was somewhat. Uh, didn't catch that, Ron. Yep, we didn't hear what you said, Ron. That's good. That's good. I didn't say anything intelligible. Okay, good. Okay. <clears throat> We can see, it, especially that this man relied on God um, and not his wife. Um, the wife told him what the man told him, and but he wanted to know from God uh, himself and how to instruct how to instruct the raise of the child. I don't. This is what the I instructions see. were given times. Then sorry, Ron. I just said the instructions were given three times then. First to the wife, then to the husband, and then again to both of them. Okay. Does that symbolize the first, second, and third angel's message? It would seem. I, I mean, in the action of his wife, she denotes that his countenance was very terrible. Mm. So yeah. we have fear God. Manoah in his prayer gives glory to God. At the birth of Samson, we have the hour of God's judgment that begins with the Philistines. But we also have Samson being raised according to the health message. Does that make sense? Could you repeat that again? Okay. When, as we read here, the woman 
came, told her husband, saying, Man of God came unto me, and his countenance was like the countenance of an angel of God, very terrible. Can this symbolize fear God? Now, when Manoah prays, in his prayer, is he not giving glory to God? Now, when Samson is born, is this not a representation of the hour of God's judgment that is coming upon the Philistines? So in this situation, can we also see, or am I off track, that this represents the messages of Revelation 14? Well, well, it, it definitely must. And um, um, we're going to see a lot more showing this as we go through here. Um So I think, you know, the main thing about this is it seems to me this is the repeat of Millerite history. This is, um, it's, it's looking at the four generations of Adventism. There's no doubt about that. But when it comes down to Samson, Samson becomes a repeat of Millerite history. So we have, uh, with his birth, 1989 to... Uh, the Sunday law, or however we look at that, to the second company. Well, when we're looking at this with Samson, we have examples that are being presented. The instruction to Manoah's wife is very specific. No wine, eat no unclean thing. Now, the eat no unclean thing stands out because those that would have been of the children of Israel would have at that time been instructed in the law that was given to Moses. Mm -hmm. Just as we today should be familiar with the health message that was given to the church by Ellen White. Yet how many times is this health message set aside? Well, it's set aside all the time. So those that would be of the 144,000 are going to be those that choose a strict adherence to that which Mrs. White has written and that which we find within the Bible. Mm -hmm. and, and we know there's a strong correlation between the physical and the spiritual. Right. But even in the symbols here as well. So we know that this isn't just about our physical diet, which it is about, but it is also about our spiritual diet. Agreed. Okay. The physical diet that promotes the spiritual diet? What? Well, it definitely promotes it, but, but it's also that these symbols represent our spiritual diet as well. We're not, we're not going to eat corrupted, uh, you know, doctrine, or are we going to... Um, 
eat things that are unclean, spiritually speaking. So this would refer, you know, to the world and things outside, you know, outside of God's word. The things that are pagan. Okay. Then Manoah entreated the Lord and said, O my Lord, let the man of God which thou did send come again unto us and teach us what we shall do unto the child that shall be born. And God hearkened to the voice of Manoah. And the angel of God came again unto the woman as she sat in the field. But Manoah, her husband, was not with her. Now, does this represent the situation within Millerite history bringing us to 1840? Or is this more representational of what we see after 1842? And then how do we apply that to ourselves today? Because it's Manoah that's prayed, but it's his wife that receives the answer. Right. So, I mean, I would put it into our time, not, I mean, I mean, I'm saying we could make an application to Millerite history. Uh, this making haste and running to and fro, the searching of God's word. But the answer is coming to the woman. The answer is coming to the church mm -hmm. for the prayer of the husband. Yeah. <clears throat> and the husband is? the one that should have rest. I mean, what, what are you looking for? Well, yeah. Who does Manila represent? I mean, it represents rest. Right. I mean, so what specifically does it represent? If we're, I mean, the woman represents the church. Does Manila represent a message to the church? Does it represent the Sabbath? Does it represent Christ? Does it represent the Jubilee? Oh, so you're saying um, October 22nd, 1844. Well, the Jubilee, is that not the rest from all sin? Mm hmm is this, I mean, with the husband, is this not representing for their time the defeat of the Philistines for our time, the message that is to be given to the world be, just before Christ comes? Well, so the message of Manoah could be the message of the right history. Okay. To some Thank you, Fed. Yeah. Because, I mean, one of the articles that uh, Miller wrote had to do with the, the typical Sabbath and the Great Jubilee, whatever, it's exactly, I can't remember the exact title word for word, um, but dealing with the, the 2520 and what that meant. Right. Um, so that's, that's the rest. But we know that it, it leads to the Sabbath rest and that that wasn't really understood by the Millerites. Uh, because they... they didn't fully understand what the prophecies were leading to. And the Sabbath becomes part of that. So it becomes part of the message of Adventism. But we also have here uh, a special message that comes to Adventism. And, and it comes from Palmoni. So that must be our history. 
because we really are in the time of Palmoni more than the Millerites were. Not that they didn't have Palmoni, they did. But that definitely has opened up in our history in a way that we um, never would have expected. Well, <clears throat> did the Millerites really expect to see the prophetic revelation that the 391 years and 15 days were going to be revealed as directly as they were on August 11th, 1840. Was that not a great impetus to the work of Miller? Well, it definitely, it definitely was, but they didn't see it completely either. Right. We have to be prepared because as we are aware right now, the health message, the true health message is the right arm of the gospel. The gospel is the three-step testing prophetic message. Palmani is revealing for us the chronology, the numbers, the everything that is going to shock the world, <clears throat> but should not come as such a shock to Bible students. So the chat in the chat, the the um, the comment was being raised comparing Manoah and his wife with James and Ellen White. Right? That's what it appears to be. Okay. So God has hearkened to the voice of Manoah, and the angel of God, Christ, comes again to his wife as she sat in the field. But Manoah, her husband, was not with her. She's not at home, she's not with friends. She's sitting in a field. What kind of a symbol does this provide us that she's sitting in a field? Um, to me, it's she's sitting, waiting for, for the angel to come back. She's sitting at the feet of Christ to hear his words. Is she not sitting where the harvest should commence? That's one way of looking at it. And the woman made haste and ran and showed her husband and said unto him, Behold, the man hath appeared unto me that came unto me the other day. What is she showing to her husband? I mean, running and telling him that the angel has again appeared would be something because the husband would have been out in the field working, and here runs to him his wife. When the, the word shoed uh, refers with Mac to me, that she's pointing in, in the angel's direction, especially what you just said. Okay. So the word showed here, 
um, as he's pointing out, um, is um, it means properly to front, that is to stand boldly out opposite uh, by implication causatively, to manifest figuratively, to announce, always by word of mouth to one present, uh, specifically to expose, predict, explain, praise. Um, so she's speaking out boldly to Manoa. Right. How about if we looked at it as, because if we take them as messages, we can take Manoa, his wife, and um, Samson as representing messages. Would, is there any way in which we can have the second angel joining the third? Can we have 9-11 here in any way? Well, doesn't the second angel is isn't the empowerment a way of looking at the the angels' messages being joined? Yeah, I mean, because I mean, we do have the angel too. Palmoni, so he comes down at 9-11. Right, agreed. Which, when, when we understand what happens in this movement, we have the first angel's message proclamation, but we can't really say that Palmoni comes at 1989. As far as the understanding of numbers, it's 9-11 that opens up Palmoni. which is, in a sense, the empowerment of the first angel is what we're, we're placing it as, not so much the arrival of the second, but it is both. 9-11 is both. But it empowers that message that Jeff had been giving. And um, um, as we move through these verses, we'll start to see this a bit more. We're, we're going to have to go back over this again, though, once we've gone through it and then discuss it. Okay. <clears throat> and Manoah arose and went after his wife and came to the man and said unto him, Art thou the man that spakest? unto the woman. And he said, I am. Now, when I'm reading this, the first time I really started to look at this verse, here again <clears throat> is the phrase, I am. And how upset were the Sadducees and the Pharisees when Christ declared, I am. So he's not only saying <clears throat> that he was with Moses, but that he was the one that gave the instruction to Manoah. I never made that connection before. That's, that's an interesting one. I like that one. So he is the one that is giving the health message for all of Israel. He is the one that is reinforcing this that if you want to have your enemies your idols defeated
you must turn to the great I am. And Manoah said, now let thy words come to pass. How shall we order the child and how shall we do unto him? Now in the Hebrew, what shall be the manner of the child or what shall be his work? But he's wanting this message, the message that his wife would bear a son to come to pass. <clears throat> And he's saying, how are we to bring this child up? You are giving us a great blessing. I am has spoken. So Manoah, if he had been a student of scripture, would have recognized that this would have been the same I am that met with Moses. But we're going to see that he was not such a great student of scripture. He, you know, um, It, in Genesis 15, 1, he identified to Abraham as I am. He says, yes. I am thy shield and thy exceeding great reward. Right. And he said again in 7th verse, I am the Lord. So he's, a lot of times he precedes who he is with I am. And now he's taken that in, in, when Jesus said it. Um, now it becomes very a much more clear why he said that because I never got why I never got why I am, you know I never got the I am, but well, let's keep studying. Maybe I'll learn some more. Well, <clears throat> here again, here's Manoah. If he is not recognizing that this is the same I am that was before Moses, he would not have recognized that this was the same I am that gave the promise to Abraham. Is this not also the condition that we find ourselves in and the church in at this time? And the angel of the Lord said unto Manoah, of all that I said unto the woman, let her beware. She may not eat of anything that cometh of the vine, neither let her drink wine or strong drink, nor eat any unclean thing. All that I have commanded her, let her observe. The admonition was given to his wife. His wife repeated the admonition to her husband. Now the admonition is given to both of them. Symbolically, what do we see here? Three. Three. The number three. Exactly. Exactly. In answer to this petition, the angel again appeared, and Manoah's anxious inquiry was, how shall we order the child, and how shall we do unto him? The previous instruction was repeated. Of all that I said unto the woman, let her beware. She may not eat of anything that cometh of the vine. Neither let her drink wine nor strong drink, nor eat any unclean thing. All that I commanded her, let her observe. So of the vine, this means she was not to eat grapes, correct? Correct. 
could I, could we even add more to that? I mean, because there's a lot that grows on the vine. Okay, such as? Pumpkins. No, you wouldn't include that. Okay. You're just referring to grapes. Okay. <clears throat> so, no eating of grapes, would that also mean no eating of raisins? They came from the vine. And aren't, aren't raisins dried grapes? Oh, so there'd yes. be raisins, no grape juice, no wine. Okay. So does that mean that, um, that we are not to eat grapes and um, not to eat um, raisins? No. <clears throat> it does mean that we are not to drink wine. But the type of no, yeah, no strange doctrines and no foods that contaminate. But I'm also reminded that Christ, when he ate the last meal with with his band there, said that he would not drink wine again until he came into his kingdom. Right. So the no strange doctrine is important. at that time with their close association with the Philistines, mm. there would have been quite a bit of interaction, both commercially and religiously with the Philistines. And it's obvious that the Philistines, where they sought to have a a friendly relationship have now turned on the children of Israel. So it's no longer friendly. This is now one that is to their detriment, to their destruction. So the no wine, <clears throat> no strange doctrine is a very clear symbol for us today. I'd have to say so. Manoah and his wife knew not that the one thus addressing them was Jesus Christ. Here again, Mrs. White is very clear. This was Christ himself giving the instruction as to what should be done with Samson. They looked upon him as the Lord's messenger, but whether a prophet or an angel, they were at a loss to determine. Wishing to manifest hospitality toward their guest, they entreated him to remain while they should prepare for him a kid. But in their ignorance of his character, they knew not whether to offer it for a burnt offering or to place it before him as food. There's that word again. Character. Okay. Character. <clears throat> It is a deplorable fact that there is a widespread neglect of those precepts of the Bible, which have a bearing upon life and health. Here is that word, deplorable. Many make the subject a matter of jest. They claim that the Lord does not concern himself with such minor matters as our eating and our drinking. But if the Lord had no care for these things, he would not have revealed himself as he did to the wife of Manoah, giving her definite instructions respecting her habits of life and twice enjoining upon her to beware lest she disregard them. Is not this sufficient evidence that the Lord is not indifferent in regard to these matters and does not look upon them as unimportant? <clears throat> so the question that I ask now, does God mean what he says? Yeah. So in that last uh, that sentence of the, at the very end, it says, 
Um, it is not sufficient evidence the Lord is independent in regard to these matters and does not look upon them as unimportant. Um, yeah, that's a very clear message saying that, you know, God does care for our, our stuff. And this is how he's telling us. She's recognizing the fact. Oh, and the other thing I noticed in here, um, yes. it said, it said, and twice in, okay. Uh, blah, 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 blah. The admonition is given to, to his wife of Manoah. Right. Giving her definite instructions, repeat respecting her habits of life, and twice enjoining upon her to beware these she disregard them. So that's three times. Right. And she's she's picked up on this. So does this admonition twice to the woman parallel the admonition first given in 1863 and the admonition that we are to give now? Um, it appears that way. If we're looking at it as all this symbolic and it's for our time, I, I would have to say, yeah. So at this time, could we agree that it is just as important for us to be versed in the health message because it is a part of the prophetic three-step testing message provided by Christ to Manoah and his wife? definitely along those tracks. I mean, this, this is why when I read something like this, when I study something like this, and I recall that when I have walked into Adventist churches and they have a potluck, <clears throat> especially when they are choosing to offer what they see as being healthy food, And the half of that church can be identified by that which is on their table. Mm. How many times do I walk into Adventist churches, whether they are attempting to do haystacks, potatoes, or other items, do I find cheese on their tables? Yeah, a lot. Yet, what does Mrs. White have to say about the consumption of cheese? No. It's unfit for human consumption. That's the exactly. exact words. You know, that was, that was one of the hard things that I had to learn. When I went through academy 45 years ago, I literally had to have a doctor's orders that I was not to eat in the cafeteria. And the only thing that the Dean had to say to me at that time is don't expect a discount because you're not eating in the cafeteria. <laughs> yeah. Yet, what did I find in the cafeteria most of the time? <clears throat> Cheese, dairy, and other items to which I was highly allergic and still mm. am allergic. I found in the Adventist schools that they choose not to follow the Council of Illinois White in their diet in their dietary choices. And a lot of other things too. Agreed. So that is that is again my witness in the situation. Mm. God had important work for the promised child of Manoah to do. 
and it was to secure for him the qualifications necessary for this work, that the habits of both the mother and the child were to be so carefully regulated. Neither let her drink wine nor strong drink, was the angel's instruction for the wife of Manoah nor eat any unclean thing. All that I have commanded her, let her observe. The child will be affected for good or evil by the habits of the mother. She must herself be controlled by principle and must practice temperance and self-denial if she would seek the welfare of her child. That is strong counsel. <clears throat> and yeah, Manoah, but mostly unaccepted. Excuse me, I'm I'm sorry, I was interrupting you. Uh, it's mostly unaccepted, unaccepted though the council. And isn't that sad? Um. Yeah, I, I can honestly say that it's about ignorance. Most of them uh, that other people are telling them, "Oh, that doesn't mean that." <laughs> You know, because when when somebody brings stuff up, you know, because I've I've done that um, and said, well, Ella White says this here, let me show you. And oh, oh that doesn't mean that <laughs> is some of the response. <laughs> it's like, oh, uh, so people are telling them that but that doesn't mean that. And they see this and so they do it anyway, you know. Um, how? Do we get them to convince themselves that doing what the Bible is right? How do you do that? Well, the biggest argument that I've heard is that Ellen White wrote that for her time. It doesn't have application to our time. Right. Um, so my question is, is that the way that you're approaching what God has written in the Bible? Your question to them. Correct. Yeah. So um, what I, I'm finding out to actually be that answer is something that she wrote. And um, it's that display of that character that people want. They want that. And that that actually draws them in to it. You don't have to say a word. You just do what you're doing, you know, because um, – some people don't want to hear it, you know, at all. And so you don't have to even say anything. You, you, you do you display that character and that attracts. But to some others, it, it also um, repels them, <laughs> makes them run away. But that's the only thing that I can see as how to how to attract them. And so we're obligated to me anyway. I'm obligated to, to, to develop that character, no matter what, I mean, to, um, to try to get rid of, cast all those doubts away that I do have to be able to adapt that character or adopt that character. And he's going to give it to you through his word, but you actually have to apply it. Right. I mean, you're the one, that has to make the conscious decision not to do it. But we've also heard, you know, uh, Balaam utter the <laughs> utter the uh, blessing when he was there to do the curse. You know, right? I, I don't want to be that one. I want to be the guy that you know wants to do it. <laughs> oh. You know, that's what I keep at how. And it's to me, it boils down to um, believing all of the word. And, and, you know, for reals. Well, not just not just surface of stuff. For us, we need to take the word of God as it is written. Right. Now, I know many within the church that will set aside the admonition that if you 
if a man lay with a man as he does with a woman, that this is an abomination. Mm. There are those within the church that have actually applauded the gay Bible that removes all of these instructions as to what was to happen with those that choose not to follow the law. It's kind of expected. Um, there was three admonitions to, um, <laughs> to, you know, only don't change God's words and then he heaped curses on it when he did, you know, so uh, all you can do is just warn them, you know, but even talking to some um, in that manner, you know, uh, they start playing this, you know, you're, you're a bigot or that kind of stuff. And it's like, no, I'm not, I'm not a bigot. I'm, <laughs> you don't know me, <laughs> bro, but I just, you know, um, I just understand what I read. Right. You know? Cause it's just, it's just what it reads. And then all the other things that go along with it, you know, it's not about, uh, the, the homosexual lifestyle is all about, um, self, not about, uh, getting rid of self. It's the way I have equated it over, right. the, over the years. Cause you know, it's for some, it's just, you know, it's a pleasurable experience, whatever. Um, that's that's how they see things, but then they they're looking through something without uh, into a book that's has all those words in it. But now they've been taken out. Does that make it any <laughs> more right? <laughs> no, it doesn't. Yeah, right. And, There's curses involved there, and and what's our obligation is to tell these tell these folks, you know, in the most kindest way that we can that. Um, they're wrong. And, and, you know, I mean, but can you do that? Will they allow it? You know, will you even try to, you know, I, or do you do it like Ellen White uh, suggested is through the, um, through the uh, display of the character? Well, you also need to direct people to something better. And if people see something better, they have an opportunity, but um, can going a bit off track here. Can I? Yeah, I don't want to talk about this topic. Can I ask a question? Sure. In um, Numbers, Numbers um, six, it talks about the Nazarene. The Nazarene. Yeah. Do we symbolize the Nazarenes? Okay. So, so the Nazarite vow. No. We, this is too difficult of a, a topic dealing with the Nazarite vow. So right now, when we're dealing with Samson, this is just a, um, a sign. That's the idea here. Uh, we're not Nazarites. If, if you're talking in the literal sense. No, I wouldn't talk. I was talking spiritually. Well, they're, they're, they symbolize Christ and his vow. Right. So, so they, well, yeah, I was just, I just, it's, it's, um, in verse three, it talks about this strong drink, not, not to drink vinegar, strong drink. And then mm -hmm. it goes into, um, he, any liquor or grapes, nor eat moist grapes or dry, dry. Mm -hmm. And yeah, so, so we know that this, we have to apply this symbolically, right? Okay. So we're not, we, we don't not eat grapes or, or, or uh, raisins. I mean, that's not, we wouldn't take that literally. We have no command in the spirit of prophecy that we shouldn't eat raisins or grapes or even, even grape juice. I've never seen it in the spirit of prophecy. Yeah, you, you won't find well, it. I, I wasn't talking about grape juice. I was talking about the dry grapes. Yeah, the same the thing. Raisins. Yeah, raisins. So there's no there's no command in the spirit of prophecy 
for us not to eat grapes or raisins. So, which even gives more weight to these being symbolic. Yeah, we, we have to take it symbolic. Okay. We need to get to verse 18. To, to S- sorry yeah. about the detour. Yeah. <clears throat> okay, so. And Manoah said unto the angel of the Lord, I pray thee, let us detain thee until we shall have made ready a kid before thee. A kid for thee, yeah. You say before thee because of the Hebrew? Correct. The alternate reading. Okay. And the angel of the Lord said unto Manoah, Though thou detain me, I will not eat of thy bread. And if thou wilt offer a burnt offering, thou must offer it unto the Lord. For Manoah knew not that he was an angel of the Lord. And Manoah said unto the angel of the Lord, What is thy name, that when thy sayings come to pass, we may do thee honor? And the angel of the Lord said unto him, Why askest thou thus after my name, seeing that it is secret or the alternate wonderful? So this is part of the name of Palmoni. So in Palmoni, yeah, Pali, which means uh, secret, and Moni or Mene, which means uh, number. Mm-hmm. Right. So here we have this uh, this name being Pali, secret. secret. So this is Palmoni from Daniel eight thirteen. But do we also not accept that his name shall be called Wonderful, Mm -hmm. Counselor, Almighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace? Mm -hmm. So in addressing this, Taking this verse, Judges 13, 18, and comparing it with what we would see in Isaiah, would this not give us the proof that we would need to show that this was Christ and not strictly an angel? Doing this as proof text method. Well, let me see here. So, which verse is that in in Isaiah again? Um, nine. I believe six. so. Yeah. Um, yeah. So this is a related word um, to what's in Judges thirteen eighteen. Um, so it's it's definitely um, instead of it's, it's spelled differently, but it's it's basically the same root. Okay. But I think the one in um, in uh, uh, judges. Uh, more leans towards the word secret, uh, though it does mean wonderful as well. Okay. Because it, it comes from the word pala, which means to separate, that is distinguished literally or figuratively by implication uh, to be positively make great, difficult, wonderful, accomplish, um, hard, hidden things too high. Um, and so the idea is that things that are hidden, things that are secret, things that are beyond us. Um, in, in course, this- we can see that the word wonderful, uh, I mean, it doesn't quite like the English word doesn't quite mean what it meant in the past. Because there we have 
wonder, uh, which means to, uh, to think about things, to, you know, to marvel at things, but also uh, to think about them. When you wonder about something, you know, I was wondering, um, it, it's trying to understand something where we just think wonderful. Oh, that's great. You know, um, but the idea here that his name is wonderful is that it's secret. That is, it's something that's hidden that needs to be discovered. And, and you're going to see that word. Um, it says, so Manoah took a kid with a meat offering, offered it upon the rock unto the Lord. And the angel did wondrously. Um, again, that word, uh, pala, and Manoah and his wife looked on. So, so the angel is going to offer this kid and do wonderfully, wondrously. So his name associates with his action. Well, the question, and this, this comes from a comment in the chat. Is this passage, Judges 13, 17, and 18, not the second time that the name of the one that appears is being asked? Because don't we find this in, in Genesis 32 and verse 29? Mm -hmm. I mean, Jacob wrestles all night and then comes back and says, and Jacob asked him, tell me, I pray thee, thy name. And he said, wherefore is it that thou dost ask after my name? And he blessed him there. Can an angel give a blessing? Well, this is Christ, as we know. Right. And he knows he's seen the face of God. Right. So Jacob asks his name. Manoah asks his name. And in both instances, they are asking Christ, what is your name? And yet we have here, and the angel of the Lord said unto him, why askest thou thus after my name? seeing that it is wonderful, secret. And then we have this same situation with Palmoni occurring in Daniel 8.13. You know, it reminds me of when Christ said to the rich young ruler, why callest thou me good? There is none good but one, God. So he's telling him indirectly, I'm God. Okay. So we have quite a bit that is here in symbols. Yeah, which we're going to have to go over this again. But I, I think the main point that I wanted to get to here goes back to where we, we, we had started with this idea that he doesn't, he, he does not tell her his name. Christ doesn't tell uh, the woman his name. It's not uh, to the woman. This is to Manoah. To Manoah, I mean, yeah, to Manoah. And, and so it's Manoah again who's asking about his name. Now, the woman in the field, okay, where is that? So, so there's something here about this woman in the field that I, I still think I don't fully grasp. Um, yeah, because I, I was asking that question because the woman in the field is... And the woman is the one... Um, so the woman told her husband, saying, A man of God came unto me, and his countenance was like the countenance of an angel of God, very terrible. But I asked him not whence he was, neither told me his name. So the woman is the one that says, he didn't tell me his name. So Manoah is then going to ask after 
his name, right? He's going to ask. So he doesn't tell the woman what his name is, but Noah's going to ask what his name is. And then he's going to offer this kid. And, um, and he offers it upon a rock. So Manoah actually offers this, but it says the angel did wondrously. So, I mean, the angel is an added word, added words here, um, in the King James, uh, so I'm going to have to look at that a little bit more, but it says one and Manoah and his wife looked on. So, and then it said, and then we're going to read what happens there, where this uh, flame went up toward heaven, etc. So you know, have you noticed this guy's name? What it means? Manoah. Yeah. It means rest. It, it's yeah. it's just um, uh, related to the name Noah. But it's Man- oh yeah, Noah. Noah. Um, I noticed it. Yeah. And it just it just has a mem at the front. It has the letter M at the front, but it's basically the same. Same the same thing. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and it meant rest. <laughs> Very yeah. interesting. Yeah. Does that mean anything with all this stuff? Really? Yeah, well that's all this we've been applying it. So it has to do with uh, the sabbatical rest as well. Right. Okay, so we're We've got coming a lot of the symbols in it. Yeah. So we'll come back to this tomorrow then. It does have quite a number of symbols in it. So now, are there any other questions or comments regarding what we've covered today? Any other thoughts? I have. I have uh, just a thought. Okay. Uh, just concerning the uh, what the angel says. Uh, he says that I will not eat, even or something. So it, it kind of reminds me of the uh, the man from Judah, the prophet of Judah. Okay. In uh, in 1977 BC, when uh, Jeroboam is offered uh, offers to him food. He doesn't eat either at that their time anyway, initially. And uh, we know that's sort of uh, there's a prophecy there of Josiah, which is uh, 350 years until its fulfillment. And uh, just in Judges here, uh, if you add up the kings, or sort of the judges, um, from the king of Mesopotamia, it comes adds up to 350 as well. And then we have this here 40 year period of uh, Philistine uh, oppression. So it's sort of, uh, this is sort of near that end of that 350 year time period. So, um, yeah, so that's just some thoughts. Okay. Yeah, put that together for us, Stephen. If you can, please. Right, okay. Diagram or something. Okay. We have to go. Okay. Shall we then close with prayer? Gracious Father, we thank you for all that you have done for us. We thank you for this time of study and fellowship that we've had and enjoyed. We thank you for joining with us, for sending your spirit and sending your angels. Be with us now, guide us in all things so that we may more properly represent your character to all with whom we come in contact. For this, we thank you. And this, we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen.